long as he lives, Ramsay's claim to Winterfell will be contested, which means he won't live long. We can't give up on our brother. Listen to me, please. He wants you to make a mistake. Of course he does. What should I do differently? I don't know. I don't know anything about battles. Just, just don't do what he wants you to do. What do you mean? I guess I, was, I wasn't really prepared for a follow-up question. Hello, you beautiful bastards, and welcome to Episode 7 of Game of Thrones Rewrite. Today's subject, the Queen of the North, Sansa Stark. As I stated in our last episode, we have concluded what I refer to as the Big Six, which are the six characters that I feel play the most essential role in the overall endgame of the series. Now, while Sansa is no doubt a major character in the show, the previous episodes featured characters whose arc conclusions were somewhat intertwined with at least one other character of the Big Six, whereas Sansa's arc is far more solitary, with her eventual ascension to Top Dog of Winterfell being somewhat detached from the ongoing the King's Landing come the end of the series, and thus she did not make the Big Six. However, as a bit of a treat for you guys, this episode of Game of Thrones Rewrite will be the first double episode. While putting together a structure for this episode, I realized that you really can't explore Sansa's arc without also exploring Littlefinger's. I was originally going to give him a video of his own, but we really don't get to the meat of either Sansa or Littlefinger's arcs until they shack up following the Purple Wedding, so combining their videos made the most sense, although this video will primarily focus on Sansa. Now before we begin, I would just like to throw down a a little disclaimer and that is I hate Sansa. I hate her, I hate her, I hate her. And by Sansa, I mean show Sansa. Specifically season 6 and onward Sansa, but we'll get to that. Not really book Sansa, and definitely not Sophie Turner. I actually think she's a decent actress as long as she's given the proper roles that fit her personality, not you, and competent writing and directing, not you. And from her public persona, she seems pretty chill and down to earth, even if she is married to the objectively worst Jonas. Everyone knows Kevin's the patrician choice. While Nick and Joe were slamming their way through the Disney Channel lineup circa 2008, Kevin was cultivating himself a peaceful existence, which includes a fulfilling family life and artistic and creative ambitions outside of hosting the Kids' Choice Awards. Anyway, yeah, season 6 and onward, Sansa sucks fucking hard. Which is frustrating because, kind of like Arya, her character arc is one of the most straightforward of the series, and thus not that hard to not fuck up. Sansa begins the series as a naive and starry-eyed young girl who eventually has her delusions about the world obliterated in the most traumatizing of ways. And yet, despite the numerous and barbarous afflictions she is subjected to, by unearthing a steadfast resilience from within herself, she was not even aware she possessed, she survives her horrifying ordeals, all the while harnessing a skill set that will eventually allow her to tap into her full potential and take back control of her life. Not by way of brute force or savagery, but with razor sharp cunning and keen perception. It's pretty straight shot character mapping. Not only that, but it has a very logical end goal, with Sansa becoming queen, or at least wardeness, of the North. Don't expect a total revision of where Sansa ends up in this video, because it seems rather clear to me that Sansa ultimately becoming the heir of Winterfell makes the most logical sense given where she began. It's just the getting there at the show really fucks up. Now, as for when Sansa's arc starts to go haywire and the trajectory of her character development gets completely destroyed, hmm, I don't, gee, I don't know. I wonder where this started. I wonder at what point in the show Sansa's arc started to make no fucking sense. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I guess we'll have to wait and see. Let's recap. Sansa begins the series as the oldest daughter of Lord Ned Stark of Winterfell. Sansa finds herself bored with the simple folk of the North and dreams of a life of royalty and romance. Her dream is seemingly fulfilled following her father's acceptance of the position of the Hand of the King, and she is brought by her father to King's Landing to be betrothed to Westeros' hottest and most eligible bachelor, Joffrey Baratheon. But following her father's imprisonment for treason, Sansa's hell begins, as she finally sees the cruelty of both now King Joffrey and his mother, Cersei Lannister. The Despite Sansa's pleading for her father's life, Ned Stark is executed in front of her very eyes. Sansa then remains in King's Landing, effectively as a hostage of the Lannisters. Season 2 sees Sansa adjusting to her situation at King's Landing, feigning loyalty and admiration for the Lannisters in order to survive. Following the Battle of Blackwater and the defeat of Stannis Baratheon, Sansa is relieved when her betrothal to Joffrey is severed in order to facilitate his marriage to Marjorie Tyrell. Her joy is short-lived, however, as Littlefinger informs her that she no longer holds the protection of being the prospective queen. He 
then pledges that he will bring her to safety. Season 3 sees Sansa still at King's Landing. Both Elena and Marjorie Tyrell are sympathetic to Sansa's plight and arrange for her to be married off to Loras Tyrell in order to keep her safe from the wrath of the Lannisters, and probably also to increase their own influence over the North. This plan is foiled, however, following Lord Baelish learning of the Tyrell's plot, who then informs Cersei, who then informs Big Daddy Tywin, who then marries Sansa off to his son Tyrion in order to retain Sansa in Lannister custody. To make matters worse, Sansa soon learns of the deaths of her brother Rob and mother Catelyn at the Red Wedding. Season 4 begins with Sansa utterly depressed, slowly coming to terms with the life she is condemned to live in King's Landing. But she is soon approached by Dantos, a fool she saved at the beginning of Season 2, who informs her of a plot to smuggle her out of King's Landing. Following Joffrey's death at the Purple Wedding, Sansa is brought to safety by Dantos, who was then killed by his employer, Littlefinger. Littlefinger brings Sansa to the Eyrie under the guise of his niece, Elaine. Here she reunites with her Aunt Lysa, whom she realizes is absolutely balls to the wall nuts so, something that we as viewers were already quite aware of. After witnessing Littlefinger kiss Sansa, Lysa confronts her in a jealous rage, and after realizing that she has revealed to Sansa her and Littlefinger's culpability in the death of John Arryn, Littlefinger shoves Lysa to her death through the moon door. Sansa is later questioned by the Lords of the Vale and protects Littlefinger by claiming Lysa committed suicide. We see Sansa is beginning to emulate Littlefinger with her ability to manipulate those around her for her own benefit, and for the first time, Sansa begins to take some control of her fractured life. And then Season 5 sees Sansa remaining at the Eyrie, holding court as the de facto Lady of the Vale, and learning more about the complexities of politics and manipulation from Littlefinger, which leads to- Oh no, that's fucking right! Littlefinger marries her off the Ramsay of Winterfell! Holy fucking shit! Okay, I straight up just deleted a two-page rant about what happens to Sansa in Season 5 as I was getting way too ahead of myself and was flirting with making this video a discombobulated mess. First, in order to understand how the writers derailed Sansa's character arc, we need to establish what Sansa's arc actually is. It seems clear to me that by the end of Season 4, the writers pretty much had no idea what exactly Sansa's arc was or what the hell to do with her from there on out. And therefore, they set her on a completely different emotional path by way of inflicting upon her one of the most needless character afflictions I've ever been witness to. Now as inept as the showrunners were shown to be by the time season 5 rolled around, and though I do not condone or excuse them completely losing their grasp on Sansa's character development, I will give them a fraction of a sliver of leeway in saying that I at least partially understand why these chuckle fucks lost said grasp. But how can I understand them losing track of Sansa's development? You just said Sansa's arc is one of the most straightforward of the entire series. And while this is true, it's also the most internal of the entire series. We've discussed before about the handicaps that switch from one medium to another can produce. In this case, because the television adaptation is not able to showcase each character's inner monologue through their use of third-person limited point of view, the show isn't able to give as much insight into the motivations behind each character's actions. This leads to a face value effect, if you will. Danny killing the slavers of Astapor is treated as an absolute high, because the show was not able to convey the sadistic gratification subtly seizing in the back of Danny's mind as she gleefully sicks Drogon on the Masters. Jamie settling the Siege of River Run comes off as a rather secondary or non-pertinent plotline in the show, because the writers weren't able to convey how his handling of the conflict coincides with his waning idealization of Cersei. We get the same actions, but lack the deeper context, and thus we take each character's actions at face value, which in turn results in our perception of many of the characters deviating wildly from their book counterparts, even those whose plotlines remain more or less consistent with the book's chain of events. Now one can argue, I totally am, that this is the whole craft of adaptation, expressing a character's inner thoughts and motivations in some sort of visual or at least somehow expressible way. Even if it means having the right scenes that are not present in the book or indulging in a bit of on-the-nose exposition to get your point across. But seeing as how thoroughly the books delve into the deepest recesses of the mind of each character, I can understand some nuances getting lost in the shuffle. But while this limitation of the show is only slightly hampering to some characters, it is full-on paralyzing to others. While we don't get as much inner context for each character's actions, most characters are still taking enough action that the audience can sort of trace the progression of their development. We see John rise from an unwanted outcast to a beloved commander, primarily through his actions. We see Cersei devolve into a tyrannical beast through her actions. And herein lies the problem when it comes to Sansa. Sansa doesn't really do all that much over the course of the series. I mean, of course she's doing stuff, but none of her actions really result in any big or noticeable changes to the world around her. And this makes sense. Sansa is basically a a hostage for the entire duration of her time at King's Landing, and said duration takes up over a third of the entire series. Her external behavior is in exact contrast to her internal, and unfortunately, these circumstances prevent her from having as many big character beats that visually
visually show how she has changed over the course of the series as the other characters do, such as, say, Tyrion leading the Lannister army against the forces of Stance Baratheon, or Daenerys locking away her dragons and trying her hand at diplomacy in Marine. Now, this isn't to say that Sansa has no impactful character beats. One of her best comes right at the beginning of Season 2, where she's able to save the life of Dantos by talking Joffrey out of killing him. It is simple yet brilliant, not only because it is in stark contrast to her lie in Season 1 about Joffrey being attacked by Nymeria, in which she lied in order to serve her own interest, whereas in this situation she lies in order to save someone else from harm, but also because she does it almost instinctively. It isn't some thoroughly concocted scheme, it's a gut reaction. She's able to think of a solution right off the top of her head, surprising the audience, and probably even herself, with the natural talent of tact she possesses. It is the first indication that Sansa has a power within her, and that her arc will showcase her recognizing and harnessing this power in order to take back control of her life, with the help of a seasoned and knowledgeable teacher, of course. But despite these occasional moments, the vast majority of Sansa's character development is displayed not through her actions, but her perceptions. As the books are all POV style, we see the world through Sansa's eyes, and thus we begin the series seeing said world through the eyes of a vulnerable and impressionable young girl, who doesn't fully grasp what's going on around her or comprehend the greater consequences of her rash actions. This is demonstrated in a number of passages where Sansa has full-on lapses in her memory. She recalls a particular event multiple times, yet each time small details are out of place. One of the most notable examples is that of the Unkiss. The night Sandora Clegane came to Sansa's room during the Battle of Blackwater and offered to take her away from the castle, Sansa, for some reason, upon recalling that night, remembers Sandor kissing her, a kiss that does not seem to have taken place. Perhaps Sansa's impressionable, trauma-ridden mind imagined said kiss took place as an expression of an unrequited attraction to Sandor, as would make sense seeing as Sansa, as a young girl Winterfell, was obsessed with romance stories about women being swept off their feet by brave, handsome knights, a case of her retreating into fantasy as a way to deal with the trauma of her reality. However, as the series progresses, we are literally able to read how Sansa grows on the page. She becomes more observant, more perceptive. By the time she reaches the Vale with Littlefinger in a Storm of Swords, she is able to ascertain Littlefinger's scheming almost right away. We see through her thoughts, not her overt actions, how she is honing her manipulation skills. But of course, these subtleties are not always as evident on the screen. And thus, Sansa comes off as a very static character for the first four seasons of the show. We are told later in the series of all the lessons she learned from the likes of Cersei and the Tyrells, but unfortunately it doesn't really stick. The showrunners didn't do enough to show us visually how much Sansa was learning and taking in. One other thing to note about the show, and I think it is at least part of the reason Sansa's arc went off the rails, is that the show omits a very small, seemingly non-pertinent act of Sansa in season one that strips from her a great deal of inner motivation moving forward in the series. In the show, after Ned tells Arya and Sansa that he's sending them back to Winterfell, Sansa pouts and runs off to her room. But in the book, Sansa runs off and goes to Cersei and tells Cersei of Ned's plan to send them back to Winterfell, which obviously tips off Cersei that Ned has most likely discovered her secret. Now let's talk about this one. As we see in the show, this plot point is not really necessary, and it really isn't in the book either. Ned ends up telling Littlefinger about his plot to overthrow Cersei, wanting him to ensure the loyalty of the city guard, which of course backfires when Littlefinger decides to betray Ned. So Sansa does tell Cersei of Ned's plan, but, and while this is argued by many fans, in my opinion, it doesn't amount to anything that probably wouldn't have happened anyway. So therefore, you would think it would be fine to omit from the television show. But here's the thing, it isn't about the actual consequences of her action. It's about the guilt that Sansa holds for doing so. In the Storm of Swords, while Sansa is at the Eyrie with Littlefinger, there is a simple scene where Sansa is making a snow castle and, without even thinking about it, makes the castle take the form of Winterfell. Now, of course, this scene is meant to represent that Sansa is homesick, as she has been away from her former home for so long. But I also believe it's a representation of Sansa's guilt for telling Cersei about her father's plan in Book 1. She believes, whether she is truly responsible or not, that she is the reason her father was killed, and, as a result, the North was left in shambles following the War of the Five Kings. Now in the book, Sansa is still at the Eyrie and probably won't return to Winterfell until the winds of winter or maybe even a dream of spring. But I personally believe that Sansa's lingering guilt will play a significant role in her character development once she returns to Winterfell. After seeing what her action has resulted in, Sansa will be instilled with a newfound love and respect for her homeland, which in turn will lead to her eventual ascension to ruler of Winterfell. Not because she eagerly wants to be queen for her own selfish gain, but because she feels she owes a debt to her birthplace and must see to it that it's returned to its former glory. And this is the arc trajectory that we're going to pursue in this rewrite. So without further ado, 
let's begin. So in terms of rewriting, similar to what we did in Danny's video, I wouldn't really change all that much for seasons 1 through 4. The show is pretty faithful to the books for this period, so all I would really do, in addition to keeping Sansa running to Cersei and telling her of Ned's plan to send Sansa and Arya back to Winterfell, is find more creative ways to show how Sansa is beginning to regain her agency and putting her skill set to good use. This way, once she arrives at the Eyrie with Littlefinger and she has a bit more room to breathe and maneuver, she is finally able to use and display the knowledge she has garnered over the last three seasons. This honestly wouldn't be all that much. Just a few scenes of Sansa speaking to perhaps Shay or Tyrion, showing that Sansa is starting to get a better grasp on the complexities and nuances of the political game. And this would lead beautifully into Season 5, if the showrunners had decided to follow the plot of the books. In A Feast for Crows, following Lysa's death, Sansa becomes de facto Lady of the Vale, and thus we finally start to see her regain her agency and put the skill set she developed at King's Landing to good use, all the while being mentored by Littlefinger in the art of strategic manipulation. This culminates at the end of the book, where Littlefinger reveals his ultimate purpose of bringing Sansa to the Eyrie. To marry her off the preemptive heir of the Vale, Harold Harding, reveal her true identity to the lords of the land, and instill her as the rightful heir of Winterfell. This perfectly sets up Sansa's arc for the upcoming sixth book in the series, The Winds of Winter. My speculation is that book six will feature Sansa utilizing all of her skills to win over the lords of the Vale, and most likely BTFOing Harold Harding by marrying Robert Aaron instead of him. Littlefinger's plan to make Harold heir to the Vale would require Robert to die, and it's more than likely that Littlefinger may not care to wait for him to do so on his own time. I highly doubt Sansa would be game for this, so I speculate she will marry Robin, and after her true identity is revealed, will ascend to become top dog of the Vale. But as we all know, this sadly did not happen. Littlefinger marries Sansa off to Ramsay, which is just so fucking wrong on so many fucking levels. As I said, the reason I speculate they decided to do this is because they either lost track of Sansa's character directory, or maybe they just got bored with it, I guess. Instead, they opted to have have Sansa be married off to Ramsay, get raped by him, and then have that be her predominant character drive up until the end of season 6. And to this, I just have one little tiny thing to say. Stop using sexual assault as a plot device. Damn it, I see this way too often in TVs and movies. And just to be clear, I do not mean to say that no film or television show should portray rape or any sort of sexual assault. I am saying, however, that if you're going to portray something like this on screen, you have the responsibility of doing so in a new and mature way by showing the true impact that such a trauma can have on a person, something that the showrunners do not even remotely attempt to do. The writers had absolutely no interest in exploring the effects of sexual assault in any way, shape, or form. They simply used it as a device to heighten the emotional investment we as an audience would have for the Battle of the Bastards. Considering what Ramsay did to Sansa, seeing her retain her vengeance is a thousand times more satisfying, sure. But then once they got what they needed from Sansa's affliction, they just pretend like it never happened and it it seems like they want the audience to forget about altogether. After Ramsay's death, the long-lasting effects of Sansa's traumatic assault are not explored or even brought up at all. The only time we see her allude to it is in season 8, where she says, Without Littlefinger and Ramsay and the rest, I would have stayed a little bird all my life. Fucking what? Sansa, we saw you survive the horrible gauntlet that was King's Landing, and then rise to the occasion when you were at the Eyrie. We were already seeing you grow into a woman of strength. Getting raped is not a prerequisite for obtaining your agency as a human being. You absolute fuckwits. Not only was the decision to have Sansa marry and get raped by Ramsay atrocious, vile, and an act of cheap emotional manipulation, but it is also completely nonsensical from a story perspective. D&D truly outdid themselves with this single misstep that not only completely derailed Sansa's character arc and development, but also assassinated the character of Littlefinger before our very eyes. And in order to understand just how badly they fucked Littlefinger up with this decision, let's talk about him for a little bit. Now I'm not going to go into a whole series recap for Littlefinger. I I merely want to discuss Littlefinger's strategy for getting ahead in Westeros, a strategy that can be summed up quite perfectly in his own words. Chaos is a ladder. This is one of the main aspects that sets Littlefinger apart from most evil genius archetypes found in film or TV. I'm sure you've seen plenty of films or shows where the evil genius character is so super smart that their insanely convoluted plans are 10 steps ahead of the hero, and when the hero does something or stops the evil dude's plan, it was actually exactly what the bad guy knew the hero would do and merely sets up the next step of his super brilliant awesome plan. Yeah, this sort of shit really takes a toll on the audience's suspension of disbelief. We may be able 
possible to buy someone predicting another person's first or second moves ahead of time, but when it gets to the fifth or sixth, it just gets a bit silly. And this is how Littlefinger's scheming differs from this sort of over-the-top nonsense. He doesn't have super long, convoluted, multi-dozen step blueprints on how to get himself from point A to B. He causes chaos and then uses the confusion that it creates in order to get himself into a better position. He doesn't necessarily know what will happen once he takes a certain action. He simply observes the result and then waits for an opportune moment which he can then capitalize on. And nothing demonstrates this better than the act that kicks off the event of the entire series, the murder of John Aaron. In the show, we learn in season 4 that it was in fact Lysa Aaron, subjected to the manipulation of Littlefinger, who poisoned her husband John. Littlefinger then commanded Lysa to send a letter to her sister Catelyn, accusing the Lannisters of poisoning the Hand of the King, which is of course the inciting incident that led to the War of the Five Kings. But something interesting to note is that in the show, it is made to seem like Littlefinger thought up the plan to kill John Aaron and then blame it on the Lannisters, which he did, but in the book there is a slight nuance that truly showcases Littlefinger's position as an agent of chaos. In the book, Lysa comes to Littlefinger first, begging him to do something to stop her husband John from sending their son Robin to Dragonstone to be raised by Stannis Baratheon. And it is at this moment that Littlefinger sees an opportunity to cause a little chaos. It's not like he had been planning on killing John Aaron and then sicking the Starks and Lannisters on each other for years and years. He simply saw an opportunity and took it. And it's not like he had some sort of grand master plan when he decided to put this plan into action. There is no way he could have possibly foreseen everything that happened following Ned Stark's arrival at King's Landing. He simply knew it would cause mayhem, which he could then use to his advantage. Another major factor of Littlefinger's strategic brilliance is risk management. Yes, he aims to cause chaos, but he's not reckless. He knows that if things get too out of hand, the chaos will be far too extreme for him to eventually rein back in. He sees everyone else in the world as a pawn, but he knows that it's important to keep your most precious and valuable chess pieces safe. And it's because of these two factors, Littlefinger's strategy of controlled chaos and his propensity for risk management, that makes him marrying Sansa off to Ramsay completely and utterly ridiculous. Let's start on how this relates to his controlled chaos. Littlefinger reveals that his plan is to marry Sansa off to Ramsay and then have her be liberated by Stance Baratheon when he defeats Ramsay in the Battle on the Ice. This is absurd. Littlefinger would never bank on one side coming out on top in a battle like this. If Stannis wins, great. He liberates Sansa and she takes her place as heiress of Winterfell. But what if he loses? You know, like he did. Sansa luckily escaped with the aid of Theon following Stannis' defeat, but what if she didn't? What if the Boltons retain power of Winterfell? Later when Sansa and Littlefinger meet up again, Littlefinger doesn't have any sort of explanation as to what he would have done had Stannis lost to Ramsay, which he did. Based on the character of Littlefinger established in seasons 1 through 4, there is no fucking way he would would bank on one faction winning a battle when he has no way of knowing or controlling how said battle will turn out. You think a master manipulator like Littlefinger would just say fuck it and put it all on Bolton? Fuck no. He would stay out of that shit altogether, see how it turns out, and then make do. Which is basically what Littlefinger is doing in the book. Littlefinger brings Sansa to the Vale and he keeps her there. He doesn't get himself involved with the upcoming battle between Ramsay and Stannis. He knows that all he has to do is wait out the battle and then work with who's ever left standing. And he knows that when it comes time to do so, he has one of the most significant assets in the land. It's the smart and most logical move. Which brings us to the second point we mentioned, which was in regards to Littlefinger's risk management. Do you really think in any alternate universe that could theoretically possibly exist, that Littlefinger would ever put Sansa in the hands of Ramsay fucking Bolton. There is no fucking way. The fact that Ramsay is a sadistic son of a bitch is no secret at this point. If anything were to happen to Sansa, Littlefinger would lose one of his most valuable pieces of leverage. Even if we ignore Littlefinger's pervy ass attraction to Sansa, he would never ever fucking do this in a million years. It's way too fucking risky. Another ridiculous aspect of this decision is that it makes absolutely no fucking sense from a diplomacy standpoint standpoint. Roose Bolton is paranoid that the Northern Lords are planning to lead a rebellion against him due to his culpability in the Red Wedding. Littlefinger's solution to this problem is to marry Sansa the Ramsay, thus strengthening the Bolton's claim over Winterfell. This is absolutely ludicrous. Why would the Northern Lords all of a sudden be all chill with Bolton rule just because they forced Sansa to marry Ramsay under the rest? If anything, the Northern Lords would be even more pissed, seeing the heiress of Winterfell being raped and beaten by a sick fuck like Ramsay. The last time someone fucked over the North, I'm 
pretty sure they didn't just lie down and take it on the chin. This plot point of marrying Santa to Ramsey in order to solidify the Bolton's hold of Winterfell is actually taken from a plot point in the book, but of course, the showrunners completely ignore a massive amount of context that actually makes it make sense. In A Storm of Swords, following the Red Wedding, Roose Bolton is made Warden of the North. But obviously, both he and Tywin Lannister are aware that the people of the North aren't going to be too happy with the man who betrayed their former king taking over their land. Therefore, Tywin, who was given the idea by none other than Littlefinger himself, sends Jane Poole, the best friend of Sansa, who had been taken into Littlefinger's custody at the end of the first book in the series, A Game of Thrones, to Winterfell under the false identity of Arya Stark, where she is to be married to Ramsay in an attempt to appease the Northern Lords. Now, of course, this leads to the same problem as marrying Sansa to Ramsay. Just because Arya Stark is married to Ramsay doesn't mean the Northern Lords would not rebel against the Boltons, which leads to the biggest nuance in the books that the showrunners didn't seem to understand. The plan to marry Jane Poole, aka Arya Stark to Ramsay, was set in motion before the death of Tywin Lannister and the subsequent collapse of House Lannister. Should the Northern Lords decide to rebel against the Boltons, they would then know that the wrath of Tywin Lannister and the forces of King's Landing would soon be upon them. But following Tywin's death and the waning of the Lannister influence over King's Landing, this is what causes the Northern Lords to become more bold in their consideration of rebelling against Roos. After Tywin's death, the marriage of Arya Stark to Ramsay means nothing, a fact that Roos is well aware of which leads to him becoming even more of a paranoid wreck. Okay, so I think I made my point as to how horribly bad this deviation made by the showrunners truly was. So let's rewind and see if we can get these characters back on track. Our rewrite will follow the plot progression of Santa Ark and A Feast for Crows. And we'll see, instead of Littlefinger sending Sansa to the Winterfell at the beginning of Season 5, Littlefinger and Sansa remaining at the Eyrie, where Sansa, now de facto Lady of the Vale, is finally able to use the lessons she learned during her time at King's Landing to win over the Lords of the Vale, with the ultimate intention of Littlefinger eventually revealing Sansa's true identity and having her become heiress of Winterfell. Meanwhile in Winterfell, we see the Bolton plotline unfold through the eyes of Theon Greyjoy. We see Roos and Ramsay preparing for their battle against Stannis, which ultimately culminates in Stannis losing the battle in the ice. I know, I know, I'm not happy about it either. The show fucked up Stannis' plotline so badly, I honestly couldn't think of a scenario where Stannis coming out on top in this battle leaves the series with anything even resembling the plot progression we see in the show. But we'll go into depth about this in Stannis' video. For now, we're sticking with Stannis losing the battle of the ice to Ramsay and Roose. Word of Stannis' defeat obviously reaches the Vale. Littlefinger is delighted, realizing that all the Knights of the Vale have to do now is take one Winterfell and instill Sansa as Queen of the North. However, Sansa is horrified. Realizing that Stannis' forces have been defeated, she knows that there is nothing stopping Ramsay from heading the Castle Black and fucking Jon Snow's shit right the fuck up. As Jon, even though he is a bastard, is the last known remaining threat to Ramsay's claim over Winterfell. Fearful for her brother, instead of remaining safely at the Vale, Sansa makes her way to Castle Black on her own in order to warn Jon of the incoming wrath of the Boltons. And now on to Season 6, which basically serves as a season-long setup for the Battle of the Bastards. Now I'm basically going to completely drop my references to the books at this point in this episode because, well, there's a pretty big ass chance that the Battle of the Bastards is not going to take place in the book, at least not even remotely similar to the way it happens in the show. See, in the books, the circumstances surrounding the battle on the ice between Stannis and Ramsay are way, way, way different. Stannis is alive and is actually doing pretty damn well in securing forces to aid him against the Boltons, including 20,000 Bravosi sellswords by way of making a deal with the Iron Bank, another plot point that was oddly repurposed in Season 4 of the show that went literally nowhere. On top of that, there will be no mass abandonment by Stannis' men for his sacrificing of Shireen, because Shireen is a castle black. Also, Theon and Jane Poole are with Stannis following their escape from Winterfell. And to top it all off, Roose has been steadily losing support with the Northern Lords. So if any of the Northern Lords were planning on revolting against Roose, doing so on the eve of his battle with Stannis, the man that their former warden Ned Stark claimed to be the rightful king of the Seven Kingdoms, would seem like the most likely time. The point I'm getting at is that there is a very, very strong probability, unless something completely inexplicable happens that Stannis is going to win the battle in the ice. As for what happens after, I cannot say. Probably some sort of conflict with Sansa arriving at Winterfell with the Lord to the Vale, but I'm not sure. Anyways, I digress. Shit is way too different in the book to even begin to compare it to the show, so we're just gonna stick with the show's order of events. And thus is the mess that D&D vomited onto our screens. Season 6 sees Sansa reuniting with Jon at Castle Black as their forces prepare for the impending battle against the Boltons. And thus is the birth of the Sansa Stark that I I fucking hate. Shut the fuck up. 
God, she becomes so fucking annoying at this point in the series. I'd say even more so than bratty-ass season one Sansa. She's all like, I know Ramsay, and you don't. Listen to me. Why don't you take my advice? The problem is that she has no advice to give. Since the writers stripped from her the most integral part of her arc, her learning the tricks of the trade from Littlefinger at the Vale after Lysa's death, Sansa has no military experience or any skills that would even remotely help with the fight against the Boltons. The show really, really wants the audience to think she does, but she doesn't. She says she knows how Ramsay's mind works and how she knows how he likes to hurt people and that that can be useful in Jon's military strategy. Ramsay has twice the number of men than Jon does. No amount of psychotherapeutic insight into Ramsay's daddy issues is going to help him in this scenario. The only real piece of advice that she gives him is, Don't do what he wants you to do which is supposed to try to trick the audience into thinking that Sansa was actually super smart because Jon ended up falling for Ramsay's bait when he killed Rickon. Okay, so again, the idea is that Jon charging first led to the defeat of his forces, but like, what else could Jon have done? At some point, the armies would clash, and seeing as Ramsay's army was twice as big, Jon's forces being surrounded would have probably happened eventually. Jon's decision to meet Ramsay in an open field with half the amount of men was stupid from the start. Also, what the hell was with Jon and Sansa's inability ability to gather enough northern support to take on the Boltons. The Boltons orchestrated the Red Wedding. Why the fuck would any northern house not jump at the chance to join the army of the children of Ned Stark and take vengeance upon the Boltons? Shit, John Sansa don't even need to actually fight the Boltons. It's established in season 4 that Roose's rule over the north is shaky at best. So why would any northern house remain loyal to Roose's sadistic fuck of a son instead of just rebelling against the Boltons as soon as word got out that Ned Stark's bastard was marching on Winter Fell. You can tell on the show that they're really grasping at straws to come up with reasons as to why the other northern houses won't support John. House Glover's all like, well, a lot of my men died when they were fighting for your brother because he couldn't keep it in his pants. Dude, Ramsay will flay your fucking kids. Talk about the lesser of two evils. But of course, as nonsensical as it is, John isn't able to secure most of the northern houses to aid him and then meets with Ramsay in an open field with half the number of men because fuck logic. The fuck is John thinking? He's gonna like whip out a Yu-Gi-Oh starter deck and then start jabbering on about the heart of the cards? Fuck off. Anyway, just as John is about to get his shit royally fucked, a miracle happens. The Knights of the Vale show up and win the battle, and it was all because of Sansa. Yay! Isn't that great? Wasn't that super awesome and cool and just the most amazing thing you've ever fucking seen? What the fuck even happened at the end of season 6? Sansa bitches to Jon about Jon's forces not being strong enough, but doesn't tell him that she can easily hit up the Lord of the Vale because, uh... Why? I've gone on every single scenario in my head trying to think of a reason as to why Sansa didn't tell Jon she had an army twice the side of Ramsay's at her beck and call. Perhaps Sansa didn't trust Littlefinger to follow through. This seems really dumb, seeing as Littlefinger's entire original plan was counting on Stannis defeating the Boltons, so why wouldn't he help the North since helping them would only benefit him in virtually every way and get his plan back on track? Perhaps she was just as surprised as Jon and the Northern Army when the Lord of the Vale showed up and saved them, which seems unlikely seeing as Sansa was straight chilling up on the hill with Littlefinger when they arrived. Like, what even happens in this moment? Did the Knights of the Vale literally just show up at this very second, or were they waiting in the wings so they could get the drop on Ramsay? The only solution I could possibly even begin to buy was that Sansa believed that telling Jon about the Knights of the Vale would then result in Jon, one way or another, revealing said fact to Ramsay, which would most likely result in Ramsay just holding up in Winterfell, as he obviously wouldn't go toe-to-toe -to -toe with such a massive army in an open field. Sansa kept the Knights of the Vale on standby and in secret in order to draw Ramsay into the open field and then flank him, which is okay, I guess, but, I mean, it does mean that Sansa willingly let hundreds of her own people die and even risk the life of Jon in order to make this plan work. It also seems a bit unnecessary. If the Knights of the Vale pledged their allegiance to Jon and Sansa, you don't think the other Lords of the North would then have enough confidence in Jon to dispel their loyalty to Ramsay? Then all they would have to do is storm Winterfell and shove a pike up Ramsay's ass. But fear not, as there is a scene in the following episode where Sansa directly addresses her not telling Jon about the Knights of the Vale. Can't wait to hear her thorough explanation as to why she kept such vital information from her brother. Should have told you about him. About the Knights of the Vale. I'm sorry. Okay, so I guess she doesn't give any explanation to, to John whatsoever, but, uh, okay. But lucky for you, beautiful bastards, I found a missing portion of the scene that was cut from the show that gives us a bit more insight. 
Let's watch. Should have told you about him. About the Knights of the Vale. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah. Why? Why'd you do that? Why'd I do what? Why? Why didn't you tell me about the um the Knights of the Vale? Well, could I? I almost got fucking killed. Yeah, I know. It's just I got my fucking shit fucking wrecked. Yeah, no, I just I, I just couldn't trust Littlefinger. I I understand that, but like, what we really could have used the Knights of the Vale. Yeah, I, I I mean I know that's why I called them. Yeah, but why didn't you tell me about it? I'm sorry. It's like, no, no. It's it's fine now. But like, why didn't you tell me before? Why we lost one one, dude. Who? What the, what the fuck is a 1-1? One, one? The giant. The arrow in the eye. Why well, didn't... I didn't know who the fuck... It's not like you fucking introduced me. So, yeah, this entire saga was complete fucking hogwash. However, there was one other scenario that I had considered shortly after this episode aired that actually made me think that maybe D&D &D actually had at least one set of balls between the two of them. Following the arrival of the Knights of the Vale, Sansa gives this weird-ass look to Jon when he's running towards Winterfell, and then, of course, later she is super salty after Jon is made King of the North. So my theory was that Sansa had conspired with Littlefinger to ensure that Jon died at the Battle of the Bastards. Sansa doesn't tell Jon about the Knights of the Vale, which leads to his near death on the battlefield. Sansa, however, keeps the Knights of the Vale in the wings, waiting for shit to get bad enough that she assumes Jon's probably dead at this point. Then she sends in the Knights of the Vale to finish Ramsay off. And then, of course, she gets pissed when she sees Jon still alive, and thus she can't take over Winterfell herself. As much of a raging bitch this would have made Sansa, I can't say I wasn't at least semi-intrigued that seeing Sansa become a villainous character and her and Jon going head to head over leading the North in season 7. At least it would have been a ballsy move. But alas, this did not happen. And that weird look Sansa gives Jon the battlefield, the one that I assumed meant she was counting on Jon to die during the battle, well, according to the script, this shot is paired with this scene description. From Sansa's high and wide perspective, we see Jon, Tormund, and 1-1 tearing after Ramsay, with 1-1 in the lead. But Ramsay will get to Winterfell first. Even from this distance, Sansa knows who she She's watching. The situation does not look good to her. I, I I have absolutely no idea what this means. Is she afraid of John? Is she afraid for John? I forget it. Fuck it. Let's go back to the beginning of season six and redo this shit. So in our rewrite, Sansa leaves the Eyrie at the end of season five and makes her way to Castle Black to touch base with John, who is most surely about to get his shit wrecked by Ramsay once Ramsay's forces have recuperated from the battle on the ice. Again, John is a bastard and therefore technically does not have a claim to Winterfell, but Ramsay is not going to risk the Northern Lords eventually rallying behind John. Quick side note. In in season 4, Sansa reveals her true identity to the Lord of the Vale, but we're gonna skip that shit. Sansa has yet to reveal her true identity to the Lord of the Vale in the book, so we're gonna go with that as it will come in handy in our rewrite. So Sansa meets up with Jon and warns him that Ramsay is preparing forces to storm Castle Black. Together, just as we see in the show, Sansa and Jon travel to the Northern Houses to try and gather support for their upcoming battle against the Boltons. Now seeing as what I detailed earlier about how the Northern Lords refusing to fight with Jon was pretty dumb, the writers put me in a pretty fucked position with this one. I'd probably have a setup where most of the Northern Houses want to fight for Jon Sansa, but they are simply far too fractured and decimated from not only the Red Wedding, but perhaps from raids by the Boltons, Manderleys, Karstarks, and Umbers who have already visited these houses and either threatened them to stay in line or taking care of whoever revolted against Bolton rule. Maybe they even took hostages or something. It's not perfect, but I guess it's enough to make do. As we see Sansa and Jon make their way across the decimated North, we see a change in Sansa because begin to take place. Sansa began the series as a petulant child who rejected the ways of the North and wanted to do everything she could to be free of it. And yet now, after seeing what her former home has been reduced to, it humbles Sansa. She feels immense sorrow as she still holds an immense amount of shame for running to Cersei and selling out her father in season one. And she cannot help but feel, even if she is mistaken about the extent of her culpability, that she is to blame for the grisly fate that has befallen upon the North. This plot thread of Sansa wanting to redeem herself in the eyes of the northerners and make penance for her previous castigation of her birthplace is perhaps the most essential piece of Sansa's character arc that ultimately leads to her becoming Queen of the North. Unfortunately, the show doesn't really set this up properly. Sansa's motivation for taking Winterfell is displayed as far more about her wanting vengeance on Ramsay, which obviously makes sense, but it also makes Sansa's drive seem a lot more self-centered. She wants Ramsay dead, not for what he has done to her people, but simply because she has a personal vendetta against him. This is completely antithetical to what Sansa's development was supposed to convey. Sansa begins the series as incredibly selfish and self-absorbed, and thus she should grow into
into a selfless person who fights for the greater good and protects the innocent and weak, as is displayed when she saves Dantos in the book and show, and when she takes care of Robin Aaron in the books. And this move of keeping Sansa's drive as more of a personal one backfires come season 7 and 8, where her quest to become top dog of Winterfell still feels like a self-serving one. She talks a lot about wanting to have the North be independent, as they have sacrificed so much, but I just don't buy it. The show spends no time really explaining or emphasizing why Sansa is all of a sudden super protective of the North, and this haunts her character all the way up to the finale. When Sansa asks Bran to let the North be independent, I'm not really sure why this is such a big deal, seeing as even at the beginning of the series, it seemed like everyone just sort of left the North the hell alone to do whatever, it really comes off as just Sansa wanting to rule, and her justification for wanting the North to be independent doesn't make any sense anyway. A Stark is king. What the hell do you have to worry about in the North? There is a reason the reluctant hero archetype is so prevalent in fiction. When we see someone put aside their own wants in order to do what needs to be done, it's inspiring. At the beginning of the series, Sansa wants to be royalty. By the end of the series, Sansa really, really wants to be royalty. Hell of a character arc there, guys. But in our rewrite, by really emphasizing Sansa's realization that the North has been decimated by the War of the Five Kings, this is what makes Sansa finally realize that she does not belong in King's Landing, or Highgarden, or even the Vale. She finally sees that these people that she could not stand as a young bratty girl now need her aid as a competent grown woman. Upon realizing that Ramsay's attack on Castle Black is imminent and that Jon and his forces will surely be defeated, Sansa makes one last ditch effort to save her half-brother and the remnants of her house. She travels back to the Eyrie and there she meets with Littlefinger and asks him to rally the Knights of the Vale and bring them to Jon's aid, but Littlefinger refuses. He then reveals to Sansa his ultimate goal with bringing her to the Eyrie. The Knights of the Vale are to wait out the Battle of the Bastards and then swoop in and decimate Ramsay's forces. Once Jon is taken care of and there remains no male heir to Winterfell, Sansa then can reveal her identity to the Lords of the Vale and become Queen of the North. Ever since she was a little girl, Sansa has wanted to become royalty, and now she has her chance. All she has to do is wait and let Ramsay take care of the one person who stands in her way. But by this point in the story, Sansa has grown into a woman who realizes what her selfish nature has brought upon her former home, and she doesn't plan on making the same mistake twice in one lifetime. And therefore, Sansa calls a meeting of the Lord to the Vale, the same Lord she had won over during Season 5, and finally reveals her true identity as Sansa Stark. Sansa rallies the Lords of the Vale and convinces them to travel to Castle Black. We cut back to the Battle of the Bastards as Jon and his forces are being slaughtered by the Boltons, and just when all seems lost, we hear the horns as the Knights of the Vale, led by Sansa herself, charge in and decimate the Bolton forces, which leads to Jon and his men retaking Winterfell. Though the scenario seems quite similar to what happens in the show, the main and crucial difference is Sansa's maneuvering. In the show, they try to place Sansa sending a note to Littlefinger, who then rallies the Knights of the Vale to defeat Ramsay as something that Sansa did, but she really didn't do anything. She asked Littlefinger for help, and he's the one who did all the heavy lifting, whereas in our rewrite scenario, Sansa defies Littlefinger. Since since they hooked up in season 4, Sansa has basically been under Littlefinger's control and at his mercy. She was free, but not really free, still marching to Littlefinger's beat. But when she defies Littlefinger and rallies the Knights of the Vale herself to save Jon and his men, not only does it demonstrate that Sansa is putting the needs of her people over her own wants, but also shows that she has finally harnessed the many lessons and skills she has learned over the entire series. She is no longer a follower. She is her own force to be reckoned with, which is much to the displeasure of Littlefinger. This man of Chaos finally realizes that he can no longer control his most valuable chess piece, and his own future and security is at the mercy of Sansa. Once Jon and his forces take Winterfell, Jon is declared king in the north. Now while on the show this seems to piss Sansa off, our rewrite will see Sansa supportive of Jon. Though Jon says she is the proper heir to Winterfell, Sansa, still reeling over the guilt and shame of her rejection of her homeland, does not feel worthy of leading them, and thus she relinquishes her claim to Winterfell to Jon. And now on to season 7. We're gonna need to do some major your damage control here, boy. So in the show, Sansa continues to be a total asshole by undermining Jon's command in literally every scene we see them in together, and then gaslights the fuck out of him about it later. Also, Sansa's ideas in the show are fucking stupid. Her first political opinion shown in the show is that the Umbers and Karstarks should be stripped of their lands due to them siding with the Boltons. So you want to punish these houses, one of whom, the Karstarks, originally absconded from your brother Rob's rule because they felt like he abandoned them by executing their lord. 
for it. And you think telling their entire house to fuck off is going to win you any good grace in the North? You think after a period of time where the North, once one of the most banded together and loyal lands in Westeros, was left in ruin, your main course of action would be to unite the houses of the North, no matter what it takes. John's decision to forgive the houses of Umber and Karstark is the smartest move. So shut the fuck up, Sansa. And then comes John's decision to meet with Daenerys Targaryen about her supporting the North in their fight against the incoming White Walker threat, and things get even more fucking stupid. Sansa and pretty much all of the Northern folk want John to stay in Winterfell so he can... Uh, I'm not really sure exactly. What the hell do Sansa and the Northerners think will happen if John doesn't meet with Danny? They have the White Walkers to the North, which they know they can't beat, and they have Danny incoming, who has three fucking dragons. And they have Cersei and the Lannisters to the South. The North is a sitting duck and has no chance of coming out on top in any of these conflicts. So John makes the most intelligent move. By offering an alliance with Daenerys, she helps him in the North against the White Walkers, and they help her take control of King's Landing. This is literally the only option. Literally. There is no other move here that doesn't end with the North getting fucked in the ass. But for the sake of drama, the writers made both Sansa and the Northerners completely void of common sense. But John, what if you meet with Danny and she kills you? Then you'll be in the exact same situation you are in right now. Just waiting until either Danny or Cersei or the White Walkers roll up and fuck your shit. This is the only reasonable decision. And to make things even worse, Sansa is super against John going to meet with Danny until... I'm leaving both in good hands. Whose? Yours. Shit, Negro! That's all you had to say! Which makes Sansa come off as even more of a greedy bitch than she already is. So then Sansa becomes de facto Lady of the North, and almost immediately after Jon leaves, like half the Northern Lords start shit-talking Jon and want Sansa to usurp him. They want Sansa to usurp the guy they voted as their leader fucking three episodes ago. The writers decide to make one of the most loyal and proud lands in the series a bunch of whiny, backstabby little bitches, all for the sake of drama. And Sansa actually seems like she's entertaining the idea of fucking John over. The writers also shoehorn in a few scenes to try to show that Sansa could be a capable leader, even though we haven't seen anything throughout the series that supports that idea. Like, there's that super on-the-nose cringy scene where Sansa's walking through Winterfell, and she's, like, making all these strategic decisions. Stuff that, again, we have no reason to believe that she would know. Like, how the fuck did she know about putting leather on armored breastplates? When the fuck did she learn about that? And why the fucking hell would the armorers, you know, the guys who make this shit for a living not know to do that fucking shit. Bit of a side note, I realized in both the show and even in the public discourse surrounding the character of Sansa, there is this strange infantilization of her. Following the large amount of Sansa hate that existed on the internet during season 7 in particular, I read so many articles defending the writing of Sansa's character, and you can tell they are really grasping at straws to do so. By season 7 in the series, most characters, even if they begin as relatively restricted or powerless, at least to some extent grow into their own and begin taking agency in action by this point. But because the writers fucked up Sansa's arc trajectory following season 4, her character is just all over the fucking place. Following season 4, we were supposed to see her finally grow into a woman with her own goals and skill set. Instead, they just made her suffer through more afflictions, and thus, there is hardly a moment in the first six whole seasons where we see her truly display any sort of agency. Don't believe me? Sansa escapes King's Landing because of Littlefinger. She escapes Ramsay because of Theon. She later is able to defeat Ramsay at the Battle of the Bastards because she made a booty call to Littlefinger. And then later in season 7, she almost falls for Littlefinger's manipulation until Bran swoops in and tells her that Littlefinger has been fucking with her this whole time. I can only name a handful of times where Sansa actually earns anything on her own, and most, if not all of these moments, are in seasons 1 through 4. This is how badly the showrunners fucked her character up. And while the cause of all the Sansa hate could go back to the perception of female characters that I discussed in Ari's video about how female characters are criticized more harshly than their male counterparts, I don't believe Sansa fits into this. I read a lot of articles saying it's Sansa's more feminine qualities compared to the likes of Arya Brienne that make people dislike her, which would hold water if it weren't for this badass bitch being a fan favorite. I personally think that most of the Sansa hate, outside of blatant misogyny of course, is fueled by the fact that she is a horribly unevenly written character in the latter half of the series. Anyway, back on track. So Sansa's considering 
bring fucking John over, which does not sit well with Arya or anyone who watches the fucking show for that matter. Littlefinger, meanwhile, seems to sense Sansa's desire to undermine John and take control of Winterfell. He pursues this by trying to pit Arya and Sansa against each other by way of planting the letter that Sansa wrote in season one, the one pleading with Rob to surrender to Cersei for Arya to find, which begins to make Arya suspicious of Sansa. Now I already spoke in Arya's video how this sort of makes sense, seeing as Arya is so fucked in the head at this point that she's unable to understand that this letter was clearly written under duress. What doesn't make sense, however, is how Sansa is not able to realize what Littlefinger is doing. Sansa knows Littlefinger. How the hell is she not able to see through this clear as day manipulation by him? Gee, I wonder who would have planted this letter in a scheming attempt to try and make me turn against my family and take control of Winterfell. Maybe the world's greatest schemer who has been trying to get me to undermine my half-brother's rule of Winterfell and instill me as its heiress, which has been his ultimate goal for the last two fucking seasons. The writers want us to believe Sansa is actually super smart and perceptive, and yet they make her completely blind to Littlefinger's manipulation for the sake of drama. And again, the only reason she's able to eventually beat Littlefinger is because Bran slipped her a cheat code right before the final boss battle. And then they execute him with zero evidence. Why the fuck would the Knights of the Vale sit for this? Holy shit! So in our rewrite for Season 7, we will see Jon heading off to see Danny, thus leaving Sansa, reluctantly, taking control of Winterfell. She is fearful that she is not prepared to take on such a massive responsibility, especially considering the guilt she continues to feel over her perceived betrayal of her father. Nonetheless, Sansa uses the skill set she acquired while at the Vale to lead Winterfell and keep it under control while Jon is gone. One quick edit from the show, we're gonna have the Knights of the Vale return to the Eyrie at this point. This will come in the play later. Realizing that Sansa is beginning to gain confidence and capability, Littlefinger fears that he may be losing his control over her and thus his control over the North, which is why he concocts a plan to turn Sansa against Arya, an attempt to regain his manipulative power over Sansa. But Sansa sees right through this. She has been with Littlefinger for maybe years at this point and knows who he is and how he works. She knows exactly what he's up to when Arya confronts Sansa about the letter. But Sansa's not out of the woods yet. Sansa knows that even even though she is aware of Littlefinger's plan, Arya is still a wild card. If Arya reveals the note to the rest of the Northerners, it may lead to them rejecting Sansa's rule. And worse, seeing as how pissed they were at Jon for leaving them to meet with Danny, Sansa is faced with the possibility that the entire North may become fractured once again. And thus, Sansa's arc in Season 7 is to eliminate Littlefinger. She knows he will never cease his quest for power and must be taken out of the equation. He is her final test. So how can Sansa realistically beat Littlefinger? Well, we could just use Bran's superpowers, but, and we'll discuss this in Bran's video, suffice to say, he won't have said powers at this point in the story, or at the very least, he won't be able to control or utilize them to the same extent. So Sansa is left on her own. There is no one to come to her rescue this time. She must pass this test herself. Now, of all the lessons that Littlefinger taught Sansa, the most important lesson of all, that I can't really recall if he ever told her straight up, but I feel like it's very evident in his character, is not revealing one's motives. If you tell someone what you want, they can use it against you. Part of the reason Littlefinger has found such success is due to the fact that his motivations, both in the macro and micro, are obfuscated. Yes, I am ignoring his declaration at the end of season 6 that he wants the Iron Throne. This is stupid and makes no sense. The fuck would he want the Iron Throne for when the last three kings are in the ground? Littlefinger is smart enough to know that while the Iron Throne is the highest position in the land, it is also the most dangerous. And he also knows that just because you have the biggest chair doesn't mean you have the most amount of power. Add this to the list of ways the showrunners fucked Littlefinger's character up. Littlefinger's refusal to reveal his motives makes him unpredictable and insanely difficult to read. He has nothing anyone can use against him as leverage, unlike pretty much every other single character in the show. Except, except, he has one weakness. One weakness that only Sansa has knowledge of. And what is that one weakness? Lord Baelish. Call me Peter. His weakness is Sansa. When Littlefinger was a boy, he loved Sansa's mother Catelyn like no other. So much so that he challenged a far stronger and bigger Brandon Stark, Ned's brother who was originally arranged to marry Catelyn before his death at the hand of the Mad King, to a duel. A duel that Littlefinger painfully and embarrassingly lost and only survived due to the compassion of Catelyn. Sansa knows the extent of the trauma that her mother Catelyn's rejection of Littlefinger had on him, and thus she knows his one weakness, the one thing he cannot be objective about. Sansa 
Hansa is able to see that his motives, no matter how obscure, were at least somewhat hampered by his desire to make Sansa his. And this is the one thing that Sansa knows she can use against him. And thus, she sets her plan into motion. Our rewrite will see Season 7 playing out somewhat similar to what we see in the show. With Sansa and Arya's relationship deteriorating, Sansa warming up and trusting Littlefinger more, and her sending Bran away from Winterfell. Although the main difference is that we as an audience know, at least to some extent, that Sansa is feigning all of this in pursuit of some obfuscated goal. Just like Littlefinger, for the first time, we as an audience don't know exactly what's going on in Sansa's head or what she's planning. This culminates at the end of Season 7, when Sansa runs to Littlefinger, telling him that she wishes to be Queen of Winterfell no matter what, even if it means backstabbing Jon and killing Arya to do so. And then Sansa asks Littlefinger to do her a favor, to write to the Vale and command them to send their troops back to Winterfell as backup, just in case any of the Northern Lords rebel against her when she announces she is to usurp Jon's rule over Winterfell. She plans to call a meeting in the Great Hall as soon as the Knights of the Vale arrive and declare herself as ruler of the North. And to seal the deal, she kisses him, just as he did at the Vale season 4, and Littlefinger is pleased, believing that he has finally regained his manipulative control over Sansa and that she has finally fallen for him as he had always hoped she would. But little does he know what Sansa has in store for him. The day the Knights of the Vale arrive, Sansa calls a meeting in the Hall of Winterfell, with all the Northern Lords and of course Littlefinger present. Littlefinger expects her to backstab Jon and declare herself the true ruler of Winterfell, but instead she reveals the letter that Littlefinger wrote to the Vale, asking the Lord to the Vale to come and help him as serve Jon Snow. Sansa purposefully intercepted Littlefinger's letter and instead wrote her own letter to the Vale, telling them the truth of what happened the day Lysa died, that Littlefinger threw her to her death, something they had already been suspicious of back in Season 4. She also warns the Vale in her letter that Peter is also planning to use them to help him usurp Jon Snow, something that is supported by his signature on the letter he sent to the Vale. Perhaps Littlefinger would have usually been able to sniff out Sansa's betrayal, but Sansa knew that Littlefinger's desire for her would cloud his judgment, preventing him from seeing the truth, that the student has become the teacher. Having flipped both the Veil vale and the Northern Lords against Littlefinger in a single power move, and armed with evidence of Littlefinger's attempted betrayal of the Northern Lords, you guessed it. <laughs> And with Littlefinger's death, we see Sansa has finally reached her final form. She utilized all of her skills and bested the greatest schemer in Westeros, and is finally, for the first time in her life, free to live untethered by anyone else. I know it's not the best. There are probably more than a few holes and inconsistencies in this layout for Sansa's arc in Season 7, but I think at the very least, paired with our rewrite for Seasons 5 and 6, it serves as a much more satisfying and cohesive conclusion to Sansa's development. And now, of course, we have one more season to go. Sansa doesn't do all that much in Season 8, so we're only going to change a couple things. In the show, Danny and Jon roll up to Winterfell and Sansa isn't feeling it, which makes sense. Sansa doesn't know this pale-ass bitch and wants to make sure that Westeros, particularly the people of the North, are put in good hands. So Sansa being skeptical of Danny is fine. She doesn't know her, doesn't know how she rules, so it makes sense she's a little wary. The problem is again, like with season 7 and 6 in the show, Sansa's hesitation to embrace Danny feels more like Sansa just being a selfish bitch who just wants the North all to herself. But in our rewrite, seeing as how we frame Sansa as more of a reluctant leader, like we did with Jon in his own rewrite, Sansa simply wants to ensure that whoever sits on the Iron Throne will bring peace to their land and will not indulge in any further death and destruction. The only other big thing Sansa does is tell Tyrion about Jon's true parentage, which, as we discussed in Jon's video, is going to be void, since we are going to cut Jon's decision to tell Sansa and Arya about his true parentage, since it is completely contrived and doesn't make any sense. It only happened due to plot convenience, because then Sansa tells Tyrion, who then tells Varys, which leads to him wanting to BTFO Danny. But in our rewrite, as we detailed in Jon's video, the only thing that needs to happen is Varys discovering Jon's true parentage, which leads to him trying to secure Jon's place on the throne. Our rewrite has Varys noticing Danny's instability as early as the beginning of Season 7, which leads to him and Tyrion butting heads, with Tyrion trying to convince her to go the way of fire, while Varys wants her to go the way of peace. So Varys discovering Jon's true parentage could happen a number of ways. Bran tells him, he overhears it, or one of his little bird servants eavesdrops on Danny and hears their conversation. That last one probably would make the most sense. And then, after Tyrion catches on to Varys' plan to usurp her with Jon, Tyrion rats him out to Danny, which leads to his execution. The point I'm making is that Sansa doesn't need to be involved in this shit whatsoever. So we're gonna 
going to leave her out of it altogether. And the next time we see Sansa is on the council following Danny's death. Now in our rewrite, this scene is actually Tyrion's trial for his murder of Danny. Sansa does her best to convince the others to spare Tyrion's life, but it falls on deaf ears as the council votes to have Tyrion executed by Jon in order to bring peace to the land. And because the council votes in Jon as the king, this leads to Sansa being declared the de facto Lady of the North. Now in the show, Sansa declares that the North is to be an independent kingdom. Again, I don't see the point of this since your own brother is named King, and it seems like KL has basically left the North to its own devices for a long time now. And since our rewrite sees Jon being named King, I don't think the North has anything to worry about. Sansa is, of course, hesitant as she doesn't know if she deserves such an honor and responsibility, but Jon, Arya, and Brienne all assure her that she does. Sansa is present at the Stark's last meeting with Tyrion and shares a tearful goodbye with her former husband, promising to keep his niece Joanna safe at Winterfell. And following Tyrion's execution, Sansa, Arya, Brienne, and Joanna part ways from Jon and Brienne and return to King's Landing, where Sansa takes her place as heiress of Winterfell and therefore wardeness of the North, with Arya and Brienne by her side as her top members of her own personal guard. Yeah, Brienne is going to end the series in Winterfell at Sansa's side. Why they had her become a King's Guard to Bran, I have no idea. That makes no sense to me. In the end, Sansa Stark, a young, petulant young girl who cast aside her home of Winterfell for the high life at King's Landing, who was put through an unimaginable amount of hell, yet was able to survive against all odds while growing into a strong, capable woman, who came to her former home's aid in their darkest hour, and despite the hesitance and shame she holds for turning her back on her homeland, steps up and becomes the strong and capable leader her people need, just as her late father Ned Stark had been before her. Well, thanks for listening, guys. Hope you enjoyed our rewrite for Sansa and Littlefinger, although it was mostly Sansa, of course. Uh, probably not as impactful as the conclusion of Cersei, Jaime, and Arya's arcs, but hopefully this outline gives those of you who were disappointed with Sansa in the show some catharsis. And prepare yourselves because our next episode is going to be a triple episode the Greyjoys. This episode will obviously primarily discuss Theon's arc, but will also feature major revisions to the arcs of both Yara and Euron. Oh boy, do we have a lot to talk about with him. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a video. Perhaps consider supporting me on Patreon. And as always, thank you for your continued support. I'll see you next time.